Well, welcome to Real Life. My name is Zach, and I'm so glad you found this video on YouTube today. If you don't know me, I'm usually behind the camera, and I'm actually editing the video, and I'm just getting it all ready for you to watch on YouTube. But today, I'm in front of the camera giving today's message as we wrap up this series, I Never Said That. But before we get into today's message, I just want to start off by asking you a question. How many of you are all massive country fans? I'm talking Luke Combs, Chris Stapleton, Zach Bryan, Jason Aldean, all of the country artists. Now, if you're not a country fan, that's totally fine. We're going to move on to hip hop now. How many of you would label yourself a hip hop fan? You have Drake in that category, Lil Baby, Future, Kendrick Lamar, Jack Harlow just released a new album. But if you're not a labeling yourself a hip hop fan, what about alternative or pop? In these categories, you have Billie Eilish, Taylor Swift, Glass Animals, Jay Biebs, Selena Gomez, Ariana Grande, Imagine Dragons, and so many other artists. But now, let's switch topics from music to now pop, or I mean uh, to sports, okay? So in sports, how many of you are all massive soccer fans, or basketball fans, or football fans, or baseball? Okay, I'm gonna do one last one, and this one is like brand loyalty. How many of you get your drink, get your coffee from a specific company in general? I'm talking Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks, maybe even the grounds. <laughs> okay, now, whatever you decided to choose, whatever label that you just put on yourself, you are giving yourself a label. You might be a country-loving baseball fan that only gets your coffee from Dunkin' Donuts, and if that's the case, I can 100% be friends with you because that's basically me. But no matter what your label is, these labels say something about you. It says things that you like, things that you choose to follow, things that you can develop meaningful relationships from. But what if I told you, and this is what we're gonna dig into today's message, what if I told you that there's a label that a lot of us claim to have, but we don't actually mean? We've been in this series, like I said, and we're wrapping it up today, called I Never Said That, which has been a series all about misquoting Jesus. And we might think that Jesus said something in the Bible, or maybe we've heard some friends say, in the Bible, Jesus said. But the majority of the time, Jesus might have never actually said what you may have heard from culture or your friends or family. Now, when somebody claims Jesus said something, really, there's only one way to do and see if Jesus said it. It's going to the Bible. This week we're wrapping up this series with the fake Jesus quote of, if you go to church and don't sin, you're a Christian. Boom, it's that simple. Go to church, don't sin, boom, Christian. Now, some of you might ask yourself now, why do I attend church or real life, for example, or why am I watching this video? Or why should I pray? Or why should I read the Bible if these things don't make me a Christian? These are just some of the things that are a part of the Christian life, but there's so much more to being a Christian. Now, I wanna go back to what I just said about a couple minutes ago, where I talked about the labels that we just gave ourselves, you know, the sports, the music, all that. But do you remember when I said, there's a label that a lot of us claim to have, but we don't actually mean it. I'm talking about the label of Christianity. Being a Christian goes a lot further than just calling ourselves one, and if you're claiming to be a Christian and you aren't living or practicing like one, simply put, you've put a false label on yourself. And I'm going to dig a little bit deeper on this because it really is so important, and you're going to see how important it is to Jesus from our scripture today. Jesus actually can't stand people with the false label of Christianity. So I don't want you to answer out loud, or I don't want you to type it on your computer right now, but if you're a Christian, why do you call yourself a Christian? I want you to really think about that. If you're a Christian, why do you call yourself a Christian? Do you do it maybe to fit in with a certain crowd? Maybe because your friends or your family expect it from you? I really want you to wrestle with this question while I speak tonight because if you're a Christian, why do you call yourself a Christian? Because we can get a lot out of this message from what I'm gonna talk about tonight. Now, if you're still exploring the Christian faith or maybe you've stumbled upon this video, you can still get a lot of that out of this message as well. And if you are in that boat, I want you to listen and see what living the Christian life could look like and how Christians are actually called to live, not just saying the false label of Christianity. Okay, like I said a little bit earlier, Jesus had a lot to say about labeling yourself as a Christian, but not living the Christian life. He actually, 
can't stand it. I want to read to you from Revelation or chapter 3, verses 15 through 19. But before I read that verse, I need to set this whole thing up. And there was a city called Laodicea, all right? And this city was like the leading commercial center at the time. This was like party city. Think Times Square, but like 10 or 15 times better, okay? This city was the city to be in for all the new clothes, for all the new things and all the incredible things that were just happening back then. This is the place to be. But there was an issue with this city. Can any of you maybe guess what that issue was? Well, Probably not, because it was a water issue. The nearest water supply came from a distance of about six miles away via an aqueduct. And if you have no idea what a water aqueduct means or looks like, this is what it looked like back in the old times. Basically, there was like a underground pipe system that it would just go underneath and it would just eventually get to the city and it wouldn't be warm. I mean, it wouldn't be cold and fresh and incredible water at all. It was just kind of gross water. But let me put in the perspective just how far six miles away is and if you are watching this and you know the charlotte area awesome if you don't maybe google what is six miles away from my location but if you are in the charlotte area or you're familiar with it i'm going to put things into perspective for you from this church mecklenburg community church to mallard creek high school is only 2.2 miles away we could easily walk there and back and maybe still have some cold water left now here to another big high school that a lot of our student population comes from here in person is Lake Norman Charter High School. And that's only 5.1 miles away. So getting a little bit further now. And then probably our biggest high school with the population here in person real life from Mecklenburg Community Church to Cox Mill High School is seven miles away. So just think about it. We think all the times we can get into our car, we can drive from the church to a school and that's six miles and we're there in you know five to ten minutes and boom super simple but back then they would have to walk or via the aqueduct and it would get there and the water would be disgustingly hot or warm or just not pleasant to drink but now knowing all this Jesus is now speaking to the church in Laodicea if you remember Laodicea is a city so he's speaking to the church in the city and this is what he says picking it up in verse 15 I know all the things you do that you are neither hot nor cold I wish that you were one or the other, but since you were like lukewarm water, neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me. Remember, this is Jesus talking. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire, then you will be rich. Also buy white garments for me, so you will not be ashamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes, so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. How many of you all love thrill rides? I know it's kind of like going from a Bible verse to just a completely off the topic, but I promise you, it's coming all the way back. How many of you love thrill rides? I'm talking about the drop tower. I mean, this thing launches you all the way up to the air. You stop at the top and you don't know when you're going to come down. And then eventually you come down and it's a great, great time. Another thrill ride is the ripcord. And this ripcord ride, it's not my favorite, but I know some people that like it. Now, the final one is the slingshot. And this is without a doubt the biggest rush of adrenaline you are ever going to have in your life, unless you know maybe you're jumping from a plane or something like that. But I want you to picture this with me. I want, I want to paint a picture. You're stepping on top of a platform, you're strapped up into a seat, and you're slowly being lowered into the ground. You're looking straight up into the sky. The only thing that you can see is the person to the left of you and the sky. That's it. And then you hear a click. That click isn't you going up into the air. That click is you are locked and loaded and the springs are gonna launch you to two to 300 feet up into the air, but you just don't know when that time is gonna come. And then, boom! <laughs> Out of nowhere, you are launched two to 300 feet up into the sky and it is a ton of fun. But while it looks like I had a ton of fun in this clip right here, that wasn't always the case for me. Back in 2012, me and some of my friends went to Carowinds. If you guys know Carowinds, it's an amusement park on the border of North Carolina, and South Carolina. And it had, and it just at the time of 2012, they just opened up a amusement park ride called the Slingshot. And my friends and I were dying to ride this. We were 13, 14 at the time. But the only problem for me is I was a little bit afraid of heights. And this thing launches you pretty high up into the air. 
And my other biggest fear was one of the cords was gonna snap and I was gonna be sent to the other side of the park and just be concrete meat, right? <laughs> but the only way I was gonna ride this ride, because I didn't wanna be that weird guy out or I didn't wanna be the lame one, right? Is if one of my friends paid for me to go on this ride. So my friend Will said, I'll do it. I don't care if it's 10 or 15 bucks. I want you to experience this ride. So me and Will waited our line in our or waited in line for our turn. We saw our other two pair of friends come off this ride. They were in love with it. Super, super awesome ride. Then it was finally our turn. We get strapped into our seats. We're going backwards. We're looking straight up into the air. We hear that click. And I know there's no turning back. Just like that, we're launched 200 feet up into the air. And if you don't know anything about the uh, slingshot, you're gonna be whiplashed around just a little bit, but I was not ready for that. I mean, I'm talking, you're going from side to side, you're going forwards and then you're doing backwards. You're just going all over the place. And one minute, I was doing just fine, having the time of my life. And then the next couple seconds hit, I felt a little queasy. And um, no more five seconds passed, then I just, whoa, I think you can guess what happened. But Will is sitting to my left for the first five to 10 seconds, and he's just enjoying the heck out of this ride. And then it's the longest minute of his life before he gets off this ride because he's just covered. I don't need to go there, but <laughs> I don't think I need to say it. But that was probably one of the last times that I hung out with my friend Will. <laughs> But what if I told you, I told you it's all going to come full circle. What if I told you that's exactly what Jesus was talking about when he was talking to the church in Laodicea? Not people going on the slingshot ride, but Jesus telling the church in Laodicea that he's sick of this stuff, just like I was on that ride. A matter of fact, that's exactly how Jesus feels when we, who label ourselves as Christians, don't act like the Christian life. Jesus can't stand people who label themselves as Christians but aren't living a life like one. And if you remember what our passage of scripture says in verse 15 and 16, it says this, I know all the things you do. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you're like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. All Jesus wants for you is to be on fire for him. He doesn't want you to have, let's say, one foot in the culture bucket, but one foot in the Jesus bucket. He wants you to have both feet in the Jesus bucket. He wants you to be on fire for him. He wants you to mean the label that you're claiming to have. He wants you to tell other people about him. He wants you to read the Bible and get to know him more. He wants you to pray to him, tell him, and really you telling him how you feel, whether that's good or bad or angry. He wants to hear from you and he wants you to not break the law on Saturday night, but then on Sunday morning, come to church and act like everything's just fine. He wants you to experience life change that can come from him. Like I said, this is the misquote of if you go to church and don't sin, you're a Christian. This can be a very dangerous one because God wants so much more for you than just that. In verse 20, I know I said I was going to read verses 15 through 19, but verse 20 wraps it up so perfectly. It says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and we'll share a meal together as friends. What he's saying is he's gonna be on this side of the door right here. You're gonna be on this side of the door. He's gonna knock and it's up to you whether you answer that door and let him in or not. Are you willing to commit growth with God? Let me recall what I said earlier. Is Christianity just a label to you? You know, Robbie did a message like this when I was in high school. And when I was in high school, right about now in this message, I felt a little bit guilty about myself because I was doing those things. I was going to parties on Saturday nights and then Sunday morning I was volunteering or I was coming on Sunday morning to service and I acted like nothing happened. And I was guilty with the life that I was living. I was one foot in the culture bucket, one foot in the Jesus bucket. I was claiming I was a Christian, but I wasn't actually meaning it. And now today I'm up here talking to you about this issue because it's so important to grasp if you're a Christian. We're supposed to live a life that chases after Jesus. So let me ask you this. If you're a Christian, why do you call yourself a Christian? This brings up a great time to talk about what living the Christian life looks like. How can you be on fire 
for Jesus. If you are that lukewarm Christian or if you created that false label for yourself, but you just want to get rid of that and want to jump into the Christianity, I'm all in, I want to be on fire. These are some practical application steps that you can do right after this message. The first thing you can do <clears throat> is connect with God. This is such an important step if we want to get past the lukewarmness that we have. You can connect with God through scripture and prayer, which is just reading the Bible and talking to God. And these are your typical, you know, Sunday school, churchy answers. But if you really want to have a relationship with God, you're going to have to learn about who God is. And he's going to want to hear from you. And he's going to want to hear from you as well. Now, in a relationship with a friend, I'm just going to give you this example for example. I'm going to give you this example. In a relationship with a friend, you're going to have conversations and learn more about who that person is. And God wants the same thing for you. And we can do that through scripture and prayer. Now, if you don't really know where to start through scripture, I, re I recommend that you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these are the four books of the Bible that walk through Jesus's life. And it'll really give you a great idea of who Jesus was while he was here on earth. And it will also give you an idea of how we can model our lives with our one life here on earth after Jesus. So that's the first way. We can connect with God through scripture, through prayer, all these things. The second thing that we can do is we can change the world. And we can change the world through love. Jesus so clearly calls us to love everyone no matter who they are or if they've wronged you. It doesn't matter if they are completely different from you. Jesus loved everyone and he wants us to do the same thing. I know it's hard, believe me. I'm still struggling with that today, but with so much hate and division in today's world, if we as Christians love on everyone, I can promise you that's gonna stand out. I mean, that's not gonna go unnoticed and it might be hard at times, but I know that this is another way that we can be on fire for Jesus. Okay, the third thing is you can build community through real life. You can keep attending real life and build meaningful relationships here at real life. And you can email us at reallife at mecklenburg.org if you have any questions on how you can do that. When you surround yourself with like-minded people, it can take you so much further than if you're surrounding yourself with people who aren't of God. When you build community here at real life, it creates relationships that last a lifetime. And when I attended real life, I found my people. And when I found my people, these are people that really pushed me to know God more every single day. And to this day, we still talk. We still encourage each other in our relationship with God. And we still meet up for lunch and just really build that community. Now, if you find people like that, if you find people that are going to help you grow closer to Christ rather than away from him, it's going to be awesome. That's going to help you live that life that will model and live that uh, life on fire for, for God. Now, the final thing is you can live God's will for your life. And this is a hard one to do because when there's a book written thousands of years ago, it's hard for us to be like, okay, I'm going to do this thing that what this guy said 2,000, 3,000 years ago, rather than what I want to do right now in this moment. But if you want to be on fire for Jesus, he wants you to live a life that honors him. Now, these are just some of the ways that you can do this after watching this video. You can connect with God by scripture and prayer. You can change the world through love. You can build community through real life and you can finally live God's will for your life. He doesn't want you to be that one foot in the culture bucket, one foot in the Christian bucket. He wants you to be all in. He wants you to be on fire for him. And I feel like if you take these four application steps that I just gave you, you can do that after this video. Let me pray for us. Dear God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for whoever is listening to this message right now. I don't know whether they're exploring the Christian faith or whether they are in that lukewarm Christianity or maybe they're just a Christian. I just pray that this message would encourage them to live a life that honors you and really just go all in for you. I pray that this uh, student or whoever is watching this video um, can really uh, turn to you and whenever it might get hard, I pray that they can um, find that community um, of friends that will bring them closer to you rather than away from you. So me and my prayer. Amen. Thanks for joining us.